Have you ever wondered whether your favorite book is in the public domain? Where would you go to find out? I'm Greg Cram from the New York Public Library. Hey, I'm Mark Gross. I'm president of Data Conversion Laboratory. Welcome. So recently, a, a patron asked the New York Public Library to digitize a copy of the Hardy Boys Mystery of the Flying Express. One of the first things we check when we get a request like this is whether the book is even in the public domain or protected by copyright law under the U.S. law. To do that today, it takes time and effort to track down the right copyright records to make the calculations that we need to do. We spend time and resources to make these determinations, but this is hard to scale, especially in light of the vision of the president of the New York Public Library. This is Tony Marks, the library's president. He, he has a vision for our service and for our patrons. He wants to make any book ever published available to anyone, anywhere, at any time, at no cost to the user. It's an ambitious vision that will require a mix of licensing and finding works that are in the public domain. For public domain books that aren't already available in some digital form, whether that's EPUB or PDF, we'll need to find them and digitize them. That way we can make them available anywhere. But I'm gonna to focus today on the any book portion of this. Uh, this is my uh, example of all of the books. Here's my representation of all books ever published in all time. Tony did say, all books or any book. So here's here's all books. I'm going to start to break down this task uh, this way. So it, all books published in the U.S. before 1928 are in red, and all of those works are in the public domain. So this red section is not really much of a copyright problem. The works are in the public domain. It's really more of a resource problem. How do you fund the digitization of all of those works? Uh, on the right side of the chart for books published after 2000, there's also not much of a problem. Most books published after 2000 are published as ebooks that we can access through subscriptions, through ebook deals, or, or are available in open access. For the most part, making books available in this time period is also just a resource problem. How much money do you have to acquire books? What that leaves, though, is this Gordian knot in the middle to unravel. Uh, but I can take a slice of this. I can split this Gordian knot in the middle uh, in a particular way. I can say the works that are in the public domain and those that are in copyright. So these are all the books published between 1928 and 2000, and some of these are in the public domain. My job is to go find those books, especially the books that are not yet digitized. But we've got to go look for them. And where do we look to determine the copyright status of a work? Well, we go to something that is the record of American creativity. One of the best records of American creativity is currently locked in a set of paper records that are difficult to search and require a high level of expertise to use. They document a significant part of the literary, musical, artistic, and scientific production of the United States from 1870 to 1977. They are essential to understanding what remains protected by copyright law today. This record of American creativity is embodied in the records of the United States Copyright Office. The Copyright Office has many different types of records and each of them take a few different forms. I'm gonna focus first on the ca card catalog. Uh, imagine rows and rows of cards uh, stacked in card cabinets that look like this and look like this. And for years, this record was only accessible if you traveled to Washington, D.C. to see them in person, or you paid someone to do that search for you, which tended to be expensive. The Copyright Office has made progress in making these records easier to access. They've taken digital images of these cards and built something called the Virtual Card Catalog. The Virtual Card Catalog is great. It gives us remote access to these images, but the experience of using the virtual card catalog is an analog experience. It's nearly identical to using the physical collection. Images are arranged by the drawers the physical cards are in. Users have to open these virtual drawers to see the cards within the drawer. There's you know, 45 to 50 million cards here, and the searching over the cards is rudimentary, imprecise, and unreliable. Much of the data embedded within the cards has not yet been accurately transcribed. So instead of searching these records like you would any other 
uh, electronic database, you end up using this as though you would use the physical card catalog. You've got to know which drawer, you've got to know which card, you've got to find the cards in order, and that's how you find the information you're looking for. The good news is that the information in these cards lives in another form, and that form should be an easier form to use and to convert into a searchable database. That form is the Catalog of Copyright Entries, the CCEs. This was a serial publication produced by the United States Copyright Office, and it's published across 660 volumes. Uh, this is the Copyright Office's collection on your screen right now to see all of the volumes together. These CCEs include the essential facts of copyright registration and renewal. And these records are important to determine the copyright status of published items in the collections of cultural memory organizations. That's because there was a time when rights holders had to comply with the legal formalities to maintain copyright protection for their works. The Copyright Office, in cooperation with the Internet Archive, imaged them. But the experience of using the, digi the digitized CCEs is basically the same as the physical. You need to know which of the 660 volumes to search in, and the text extracted through Internet Archive's digitization is, is just frankly not high quality. It produces lots of false positives and false negatives, which might be fine for some books, but when we're looking at data, in particular this kind of data, we need accuracy. That's because when we're searching these records, we're often looking for the absence of information. The absence of a registration or the absence of a renewal informs our risk analysis greatly. Others have tackled the transcription of small slices of these records, but there is no complete data set. Not at all. And the use of these tools, even digital tools, requires specialized knowledge. You have to know which drawer the particular card should be in. You have to know which category of works the item should be in and which years to search. Today, these searches take time and multiplied by all of the cultural heritage organizations wanting to digitize their collections. This costs these organizations hundreds of thousands of hours per year unnecessarily. Look, this should be easier. Searching our country's copyright records should be easier than this. We need faster and better access to this data. And after all, these records are just data. In fact, it should be as simple as possible to do a search of all of the Copyright Office's records about particular books or particular works. You should be able to search a database that gives you highly accurate and well-formed results. For example, if you searched for Flying Express Dixon, you should be able to get a search result that looks something like this. Uh, this is all of the information the Copyright Office knows about this particular work that's been, that's been transcribed and parsed so that it, you could present it in this screen to you. You should also be able to see the original records to be confident that we got it right. You should be able to see the original printed records in the CCEs or in the card catalogs. And in fact, you should even be able to see all of the recorded documents related to this particular work in a single search. Even better, I'd love to turn this data into links out to other resources so you can search all of the books published by this particular publisher in the data set. These records are important so that we know whether this book is still protected by copyright today. And looking at this record, this book appears to be still protected by copyright today. But before we can get to that point, before we can make it easier, we've got to begin with the data. And our intervention into this space was announced in March of 2018, which feels like ages ago. But we've decided to start with a catalog of copyright entries. We partnered with Mark and DCL to make these paper records into actionable tools. I'm going to turn this over to Mark to tell us how DCL is doing that. Mark. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Um, can we go to the next slide. So there we go. Um, yeah, this has been a very exciting uh, project. We were part of the way through it. I guess we're about like halfway through it. But, uh, uh, we started in 2018, and it's a very exciting project for a number of reasons. And, uh, and uh, you know, I mean, what we do at DCL is structure 
uh, information in large collections like this. And this is really a very important collection, as Greg has, has pointed out. So scanning, uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, the scanning itself is great for uh, for uh, for re retaining the record, being able to uh, get collect information like these card catalogs and have them sitting there. And they're great for uh, you know OCR has become a, a, a you know very uh, uh, very accurate. The technology has has gotten much better, and it's it's very inexpensive. To collect very large collections of information and get the OCR in there and they get to you know getting to 99% accuracy automatically and, and, and that all works uh, and, and it works for a lot of kinds of works very well it, uh, you know if you're scanning uh, uh, novels you're scanning uh, uh, trade books books that just that are that just read read uh, you know basically the kind of things that uh, you, you, you read through that that's that's really good enough and it works well uh, but once you get to uh, inf you know information like what we're talking about over here you've got uh, it, it's you know but you've got other problems going on and I think uh, next page will probably be a good illustration of that uh, these are you know uh, this this is a page from from the from the from the books that that Greg was just showing you um, and and it's typical of, of you know other kinds of collections where you know it's, it's contains information that's uh, in, in records, contains information that has been collected in various ways. Uh, if you just scan this book uh, and, and use automatic optical character recognition (OCR), you end up with some. Uh, you end up with all the characters on the page, and you'll get a pretty high uh, accuracy. Uh, but there's a lot of, but it, it, you know, and and the top of this page is sort of what it's gonna, what it's gonna look like be, uh, behind the behind the scenes. You'll get all the words. Uh, you can get information about where every word starts and ends. You can get information, possibly on uh, on whether it's been uh, uh, whether it's italics and and uh, other kind of things that. But once you get to a book like this, you've got it, just getting the book the information isn't really very helpful. For one thing, it's uh, three columns across. Uh, OCR doesn't do very much with that. You just get that information uh, going across the field. Um, and, and then the information is really something that you read, right? Each one of these records sits by itself. So um, I know it's not that easy to, to read this. If you go through the top, on, on the top left side over there, the top column, you've got the first five lines is really a record that contains information uh, about the, the author's name, the last name and the first name, and uh, the, the fact that it's continued from the previous page and the, and and, uh, and and all the other fields that, uh, that Greg showed you on the cards below in his vision of how this should be working. Uh, but the computer, uh, the computer doesn't know anything about how to separate all those things. Doesn't know anything about uh, which part of it is a name, which part of it is a title, which part of it is the publisher, which part is the date. Uh, it doesn't know any about those things. So if you do a search against something like this, you're going to get a lot of false, uh, false, uh, uh, false positives, right? So if you're looking for, uh, uh, um, you know. Uh, 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 embryology and its evidence, uh, you, you're going to find possibly that book, but there's lots of other books like that, and you really want to know the one that's by that particular by, by that particular author. Uh, it's not going to be found together together because it doesn't know what an author is, it doesn't know what the title is, it doesn't know any of those pieces, it just knows just text. So that kind of search is fine uh, when you're looking for a needle in a haystack and are willing to to go through many thousands of entries like you do if you did this on the Google search, for example, uh, but but not good enough. So the problem is what you need to do is is get to the point you, where you've identified what each of these pieces does, and and that's what we've been doing for uh, for for NYPL uh, over the last few years. And it's uh, as I mentioned, it's about halfway through the project, so it'll continue probably for another year or two. Um, uh, uh, and, and just before we go on, uh, if you want to look at it, uh, again, it's, it's hard, to, hard to see this, but, uh, but uh, uh, the, the, the box on the bottom shows you what it would look like 
when it's been fielded. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, there'll be a tag that says author name before the author and ending the author name right after that. And then there'll be one for what the role is, uh, in this case, who the illustrator is and, uh, and who the publisher is and all those other pieces. So it, it's, it, you know, it, it, the way this appears in, and this is XML, so uh, it'll appear other ways in other things, but XML is the way this, we're doing this project and the way probably 95% of work like this is being done, it looks like this. You've got the, it's, it's readable by the human, although not particularly easily, uh, but it's very easily read by a computer, which can then display it in many different ways. Uh, next, next slide. So, so the, the, what, what you're seeing there at the bottom is what the page looked like originally. Getting to the point of what we're describing, and uh, uh, and, and this is what it it looked like when it gets prepared for a computer. So there's a lot of things going on over here, uh, and this is something that uh, a number of years back uh, would have been done completely by hand. It's a, a cumbersome process, still often worth it, but a cumbersome process. But uh, I think what what's happened over the last uh, a year, two years, five years, ten years, is a lot of new technology that lets you take these things apart and, and pull them together in various ways using uh, all kinds of technology. I mean, uh, various kinds of artificial intelligence, AI, and AI is more is, is, is a lot of different things. There's computer vision that tells you uh, what the page looks like and, and to separate the columns. There's natural language processing that uh, that uh, that lets you read through lines of content and make decisions on uh, you know what's you know what that comma means and what that semicolon means and if we just transitioned from the the name of a, a book to the author and and so on uh, there's a, a machine learning neural network kind of things that that let give the machine give the computer intelligence about what things look like rather than have to, to program what each line looks like. And uh, more recently, in, in, in news is uh, like Chat GPT, but really behind, below the surface, large language models that let you look through, let you tell a computer this is what this stuff looks like and this is what it means. So there's a lot of technology that lets us get uh, f further in this and be able to 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 do this a lot more uh, efficiently efficiently than just doing everything by hand. And it's not that a computer does everything, it still needs to be reviewed because computers do make mistakes and don't always get it right. And uh, and you've, you've probably seen the news reports of other things that it does, but it certainly reduces the amount of work and lets you do this much more effectively much uh, than you have. But what you end up with as you go through this process, you go from a page of content which has been scanned and then it uh, went through a process of uh, optical character recognition, and then and then the the next step after that is to uh, to field everything, so you know what different pieces mean, and you end up with something that you can actually field and show on a computer screen and show as a database that you'll be able to work with. Uh, next slide. So, you know, I, I just wanted to show you that it's not just I mean the, the the work we looked at for uh, uh, for for the copyright records looks like one thing you can see what that looks like and uh, and uh, rest assured that we go through uh, 70 80 years of copyright records not all those pages are going to look the same there's going to be variations maybe different columns different so but a lot of material that's in the public record or in a private record uh, is uh, is a lot more complicated than something you could just read like a novel. These are these are pages from other work we've done for the for the U.S. Patent Office. So patent filings also have uh, uh, different kinds of of, uh, of look to them. 
and you know you'll have pages that are illegal briefs that have numbers on the side that you have to figure out where to do it tables and see what the tables all mean uh forms that are coming in with various information and forms usually have the same information over and over again but they're never quite the same so you need you need technology to be able to take it apart and and then you've got documents that have signatures on them stamps things like that that you need to be able to recognize for certain kinds for certain kind of things so uh there's, there's lots of places where you've got you, this technology comes in very very uh you know very handy it's very important because otherwise you wouldn't be able to collect all this information uh, and you can see that if all you've done with this is scanned it and just done an OCR record it's very hard to know what's on documents like this and in some places like for the patent record you have hundreds and hundreds of millions of, of pages of this kind of documentation that's in the in the background as you have in many other places uh, uh, next uh, slide so I, I think the point of this, and I think this is a this is a, a great project in terms of the importance that's laid out to it, and uh, and you know uh, Greg talked about how now that it's in a database, it's uh, it's very it's easier to be able to uh, ascertain uh, what's uh, whether a book is in copyright or out copyright. But you can see this this database itself, which which is available, which uh, NYPL makes available. Is also useful for all kinds of other kinds of projects. You can look up what all the books that somebody has written. You can see. I mean, it's not just looking for copyrights. There's lots of other information you can when you can see the whole uh, um, the, the whole record of uh, of, uh, of of creativity for the last uh, hundred some some years. Uh, and and the point is, and, and just the point of the talk about the technology has become available. Uh, it, it, also means that uh, projects that probably weren't feasible before have become feasible over the last few years. Um, uh, uh, there's all kinds of content collections, other, you know, it, like the ones we're talking about. There's lots of other collections that have hundreds and hundreds of volumes of material or journals that have been collected over a period of uh, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, 300 years in some cases. Uh, lots of complex content in there that otherwise you'd not be able to make sense of. Math, it comes, so it's very important for technical literature, for uh, for legal literature, for all kinds of material like that. And, and what's happened is the the cost of doing these kind this kind of work and collecting the the, the record has, has has gone down as technology has become available. And so I tell people, it's, if you looked at something 20 years ago and it made no sense at all, well, it might be worth looking at again uh, because maybe it makes sense right now. Um, and uh, next slide. And I think this is where I turn it over to Greg to talk about what has been discovered with the initial materials that he's, he's gotten. Yes, over to you. Yeah, thanks. So by making this data actionable and, and reliable, as Mark said, we've already learned some, some things. Uh, libraries have been digitizing books for about 20 years, and many of these digitized books have found their way to a corpus held by an entity called Hathi Trust. That's a preservation repository. We've already used some of the data coming out of this project to help our understanding of the completeness of this corpus at Hathi Trust. So the thing you're seeing right now is a comparison between the number of registration records for books and the number of digitized books within Hathi's corpus over time. So for example, in 1930, we see that Hathi might lack about a thousand titles that were registered, but aren't yet in the corpus, are not yet digitized. That means we know that there is still more digitization to do and there are places where there are under accounts that we should target. Beyond identifying the specific books that haven't yet been digitized, this data also tells us for the first time the exact renewal rate for books. Now look, you may not be a copyright nerd, you should be after this, but if you're not a copyright nerd, this is a really important number because it tells you a lot of things about the motivations, about what, why people register their works and why they go through the trouble of renewing their works. So this renewal rate is important and it's a number that others have struggled to estimate for years, but no one has ever got a comprehensive number for books. In fact, the Copyright Office has even commissioned studies on this. They've taken samples 
but they've never had a comprehensive view of the total number of books renewed, at least not until now. Uh, the books using this data, the books uh, that are in blue are renewed, and the orange books are the books that aren't renewed. What the data tells us is that about 65 to 75 percent of books published between 1923 and 1964, sorry, 1923 and 1964, were not renewed and are likely in the public domain. But let me say that number again: 65 to 75 percent of books published between 23 and 64 were never renewed and are in the public domain. That means we expect to find as many as 315,000 books published after 1928 to be in the public domain and should be readable and accessible today. Not all of these have been digitized, so knowing which books are in the public domain and haven't been digitized means we might be able to put those at the top of our digitization priority lists. Now, I said this project has been going for a long time, and that's not because DCL is, is slow. It, it's because of funding. Uh, DCL works very fast when we give them money. The, the trick, though, is getting that money. So with funding from the Ford Foundation, the Arcadia Fund, and IMLS, we've completed about 20% of the CCEs. DCL's done 88,000 pages for us. They did them quickly. They produced 2.3 million records, give, a, give or take, based on this data. And after excluding the pages, we determined that we could skip because they're duplicative. We're left with somewhere around 70% to review and do. And as Mark alluded to, I think that number is probably closer to 50% of the actual pages that need to be done because there is some set of data in the CCEs that's just duplicative and not something we need to, to copy again. Uh, I will say, note that there is a space on the fourth slide. Uh, there's a fourth space on the slide in case there's anyone out there interested in helping us continue to, to fund this work, although I may have some news on that shortly. Uh, we still have quite a mountain to climb here, but, but if we're successful, it will be a rich trove of data. As Mark said, it will help answer important questions. One question for us is whether any work published in the United States is still protected by copyright. In fact, what we hope is that it will tell us things like, is this photograph in this book still protected by copyright? Not just the book, but the photographs within it, the scores within it, those films that you love from, from the between the 23 and 64, those films we need to figure out whether they're still protected by copyright. So this data will help cultural memory organizations make those public domain calculations and to make their collections more broadly available and reusable by the public. But this is also a really unique data set. It could help answer questions about geographic trends in certain creative industries. For example, where has the music industry, the, the, the songwriting industry, where has that industry shifted to over time? And how has that trend played with other trends that may be impacting the country? So we know that economists are already interested in this data. They're interested in studying the production of works under time, over time to understand where are the geographic centers of American creativity in which fields and over which years. This data is a unique data set that will help us answer those questions. So our goal in this project and partnering with DCL is to help libraries, our patrons, and the public access these records without having to pay for that access. This is, after all, one of the best records of American creativity. This record is part of our shared national heritage. It belongs to the people. It should be easily accessible, searchable, and usable by the people. We need to be able to do this so that we can advance the progress of knowledge together. If you have any questions about this project or thoughts about it, please contact us at the addresses below. Uh, we look forward to questions during the Q&A portion of this conference. Thank you.